Marcus Tullius Cicero, in defence of Aulus Cluentius Habitus, speech delivered in 66 before the Christian era, translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham, part one. Gentlemen, I noticed that the prosecutor divided his speech into two parts. In one of them, he was clearly relying with great confidence upon the deeply ingrained popular prejudice against the trial of Opiniacus, which was held before Gaius Junius. It was on, only in the other part of his speech that he dealt with the charge of poisoning, which is relevant to the law governing this court. Relevant, that is to say, to the present case. And it was evident enough that he was approaching this second matter with marked reluctance and hesitation, and he only tackled it at, at all because custom demanded that he must. And so I too, as a counsel for the defence, will divide up my speech in the same way as he did. First of all, I will deal with the question of prejudice arising from the trial of Opionicus, and then I will t return to the actual charges that are before you for today. And I will make it abundantly clear to everyone that it is not a part of my plan either to evade the facts by suppression or to darken them by misrepresentation. But when I turn to my mind to the question of how these two themes can be best developed, it becomes apparent that the second of them, the theme which comes to, within the scope of this tribunal, appointed to try poisoning cases and is therefore the proper object of your investigation, will scarcely demand a great deal of time or oratical effort. But as regards to the other theme, the question of prejudice, the situation is entirely different. That is a matter which has nothing to do with the legal decisions at all. It has much more in common with the seditious agitations of public meetings than with the calm deliberations of the courts. Nevertheless, I can see very clearly indeed that it is going to cause me far the greatest amount of toil and trouble. Yet, confronted though I am with this difficulty, gentlemen, there is one thing which gives me a good deal of comfort. It's this. When a court such as your own is able to concentrate on the actual facts of a charge, you normally expect the defence counsel to provide you all the refutation that is necessary. That's to say, you don't consider yourselves obliged to offer any special contribution to the defender's acquittal over and above whatever arguments his counsel may be able to bring forward to contradict the accusations and prove his own case. But when, on the other hand, it is a question of prejudice that is involved, you are under an obligation before deciding between the two sides to consider not only the pleas which the advocate has actually advanced, but also those which he ought to have advanced. Take this case of Aulus Cluentius. In the actual charges against him, his own interests are affected, and those of no one else. But seeing that prejudice, too, is so largely involved, the matter becomes much more serious, because this means that the common interest, the interest of every one of us, is at stake. In one part of my speech, therefore, I shall have to employ the language of proof, and in the other, the language of entreaty. In one, I shall only need to request your attention. In the other, I shall have to appeal for your protection. For against prejudice, no man can hope to make any headway at all, unless he feels assured of the sympathetic support of your eminent selves. I confess I am at a loss at how to proceed. Am I to refuse to admit there was a scandal about the bribery of Junius's court? Am I to deny that it was the topic of controversy at public meetings and argumentation in the law courts, even in the c comment of the Senate? I can not efface from people's minds the definite opinions they have formed upon the subject, opinions that are deeply rooted and ingrained. It would be beyond my power, but when this disastrous slander besets my innocent client, like some consuming conflagration, a conflagration which is perilous to our entire community, it is within your power, gentlemen, to come to his aid. In other places, all too often, it is true, the truth which provides unable to mobilize the force and conviction. But here, in this court, the opposite must surely be the case. Wrongful prejudice is what should prove powerless. No doubt it will have its own way at public meetings, but in the court of law, 
it ought to be completely impotent. Certainly, prejudice will flourish in the minds, words of the uninstructed, but it is the duty of the trained intellects to brush it aside. True, its first sudden onslaughts will inevitably threaten to carry all before them, yet later, after time has elapsed and the facts have been duly considered, it is surely bound to wither away. A definition of a fair trial was handed down to us by our ancestors, and it is something to which we should hold fast. In a court of law, guilt must be punished without prejudice, and if there is no guilt, then once again prejudice must not be allowed to rear its head. This being so, gentlemen, before I begin to deal with the charge itself, I have certain requests to make of you. First, that you approach the case without any preconceived opinions, since nothing else would be fair. For if we, coming to a tribunal of this kind, insist on basing our judgments upon conclusions that we have already previously formed in our homes instead of deciding in accordance with the facts, our reputations as judges will be gone. Indeed, we shall lose the right to be called judges at all. However, let's suppose that you have formed a preconceived opinion all the same. Then, in that case, what I demand is this. If you find that the reasoning uproots that opinion, if rational argument undermines it, if truth shatters it, do not, I beg you, offer resistance to these processes, but dismiss your preconceived opinions from your minds, if not gladly, at least with all the impartiality at your command. And finally, as I proceed to my refutation of each successive charge in turn, Please don't store up in your minds as I go along mental notes of all the individual details you feel inclined to query. Instead, wait until the end. Let me develop my defence in the order I choose. After I have finished, that will be the time for you to ask yourselves what, if anything, I may have left out. I am extremely well aware, gentlemen, that the case I am undertaking is one for which these eight years, year after year, you have heard stated from the opposite viewpoint. Indeed, public opinion has already given its outspoken verdict, and has left my client condemned. But, if by the grace of heaven if that can win me your favourable attention, I am certain that I shall be able to convince you that there is nothing more damaging in all the world than this evil phenomenon of prejudice. Indeed, once hostile prejudice has confronted an innocent man, there is nothing he longs for more than we to put on trial, a fairly constructed trial, because that is the one way in which he will eventually be able to find some means of putting an end to the groundless slanders and escaping from their clutches. That is why, if only I can manage in this speech of mine to deal with comprehensively all of the points at issue, one after another, I am full of hope that this court and its judges will be by no means the source of terror and dread to all as cluentius that his enemies expected, but will on the contrary prove at long last a haven and a refuge from the storms which have for all these years assaulted his sorely harassed fortunes. Before coming to the facts of the present case against cluentius, there are many more things that I could justifiably say about this matter of prejudice, and how perilous it is for every single one of us. However, I don't want to delay you by dwelling on this point for too long before I come to the actual charge. Yet at the same time, gentlemen, I must appeal to you indeed. I shall see that I have to appeal to you frequently to give me the hearing I should be entitled to and expect if this was the first time the issue was being judged. Elsewhere, it has been quite the subject of very many judgments already, all quite without any sort of validity. But this is the very first occasion when the case has come up for judgment of an authentic kind. Although the charge has been bandied around for ages, it is only today that an opportunity has at last been given to refute it. Until now, the question has always been clouded by misapprehension and bias. And so... While I reply to this accusation of so many years standing as briefly and clearly as I can, I urge you once more, gentlemen, to give me your most meticulous attention and see that you have already begun to do so.